Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB AMYZF, and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclicode.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Mark Leibovit, editor and publisher of the Leibovit VR Newsletters, also known as VRTrader.com. He's speaking to us from Arizona. Welcome back to the show, Mark. Great to be here. Thanks for having me, Jim. Do we have a special offer for our listeners? Yes, we, we do, and it's ongoing with our annual forecast model still on sale here. For our annual forecast model, the 2024 forecast for all the major markets, it's a cyclical forecast, 50% off using the promo code 2022 half off 2022 half off go to our vrtrader.com website and in the promo code section enter 2022 half off and you get the benefit of that and by the way you can sign up for any of our newsletters and we have a whole bunch of them out there and uh, one in particular that stands out now only because they're running is the uh, cannabis uh, stocks we have a cannabis newsletter the vr counter report uh, people were laughing that this uh, there would be an opportunity here there's been several hundred percent moves in some of the stocks already. Very interesting time. We talked about this. In fact, I think our headline last week in our interview was about cannabis. So we can talk more about that in a moment. So are you a financial advisor? No, sir. I am a uh, newsletter writer, not a financial advisor, nor do I provide financial advice. I used to manage money years ago, but not in that business anymore. Too many headaches. So, Mark, continuing with uh, pot is hot, is the U.S. federal government going to legalize or at least decriminalize marijuana going into the election? Well, it just it's funny things that are going on right now. Um, Senator Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, the Democrat from New York, is circulating a petition in support of the marijuana banking bill, which has been floating around for quite some time. And... Um, you know, he's basically saying that cannabis, cannabis businesses are forced to keep massive amounts of cash uh, on hand, and this is a danger for everyone. And this has been the case for a while. That uh, federally, it's illegal, and uh, that's also part of the DEA, um, the Drug Enforcement Agency, with regard to their ranking of uh, marijuana for years as a Schedule One drug. When uh, the proposal is to move it down to three, which makes it virtually uh, harmless. So you have two. To uh, the fork in the road here, you got two ways to go with this thing. Maybe both uh, of the Banking Act, which has to be uh, passed to, you know, allow businesses to conduct themselves. I mean, uh, just for example, though, because it's illegal, uh, companies in the cannabis business in the U.S. Uh, of course, this doesn't apply to Canada. This is a U.S. issue. Uh, when they're filing their taxes, filing their taxes, they can't deduct expenses because officially they're running an illegal business. Therefore, you have businesses that have expenses, can't deduct them, and they have to file tax returns because of the ridiculous uh, ranking of uh, cannabis as a Schedule One, and because we don't have this banking bill passed. So two things really have to happen to get things straightened out down here in the states. Uh, despite that, you know, many states had legalized uh, uh, marijuana and CBD long ago here. I think it's like 28 or 30 states uh, in the country. And many of these companies that are operating are operating profitably and making money, and their stocks have been doing well. And some of the companies, uh, which are mentioned in our newsletter, you know, been buying back their own shares and expanding across uh, the country. So, um, despite all these uh, onerous uh, issues, uh, some of the smaller companies uh, are are prospering. Um, we have another thing that happened, of course: uh, Germany legalized marijuana. And uh, that if, uh, that's supposed to start uh, April 1st, which is obviously just a few days away. And that affects in particular companies, not necessarily the U.S. companies that I just referred to, unless they're planning on some operations in Germany. But 
for example, uh, Canopy Growth, CGC, which is really the big name in the Canadian space, which uh, went public as weed, I think it was in 2014, uh, at a buck a share and ended up getting to $58, and I think it went there twice after intermittent correction, but apparently a lot of their business, or hope for business, is in Germany, so their stock, which they just did a reverse split of, um, it was trading around 20 cents a share, you know, imagine 20 cents from $58, uh, they did a reverse split, 10 for 1, so then it became a $2 stock, and in the last uh, week, week and a half, it's run up to almost $10, uh, very heavy volume in anticipation of the Germany uh, business. And when you think about it, uh, it if it really went from uh, uh, 20 cents to uh, well, after a reverse split, and they went up to $9, I mean, it's still uh, a a buck stock. I mean, they just have reverse split, and so it looks like it's more expensive. So really, uh, if there's really going to be a turnaround in that company, the stock is a steal, even at these prices, because it's still <laughs> effectively just a uh, under a dollar a share, even with that reverse split, if you take out that split, reverse split issue. So there could still be act- activity there. But you know, you got Chuck Schumer out there, and you got all these other uh, names that I could throw out here that I have listed on my screen that in the uh, U.S. government that are trying to get this thing through. Unfortunately, a lot of Republicans don't want it. Um, you know, I can see the case that it could be an entry drug. There is, you know, research saying having having marijuana and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, you're fighting the trend. All the seniors love it uh, here in Sun City in Arizona and all across the country. The senior citizens are one of the biggest purchasers of the uh, CBD and the uh, marijuana. Uh, it's a 5,000 or more year history. It's like gold. It's been around forever. And obviously the powers that be, you know, particularly the notorious drug companies that create uh, drugs that have serious after effects. You can just listen to the commercials on national television trying to sell these drugs about how wonderful they are in the first five seconds and the next 55 seconds telling you how it could kill you. So marijuana doesn't have that uh, Result. So, you know, I'm a big supporter just because of the long history, because I hate the, the uh, drug companies. I think they're mostly criminal in what they do. Of course, we saw the vaccine issue, which we don't even want to touch on at the moment. But, you know, uh, I don't take any drugs, never will, unless it's some super emergency. You just don't know what the side effects are. And uh, they, they, they con people into buying these things, and they con the U.S. government to approve them running these crazy ads on television. So uh, I, I, I try to balance it, you know, marijuana versus the drug companies. And, uh, yes, it could be an entry-level drug, but what about all the drugs they give people and they become addicted to them? And uh, my own son had an issue with that. You know, they put you on a painkiller, and the next thing you know, you're on heroin. So the bottom line is... Uh, you know, go go for the marijuana and the CBD, and uh, I think it should be legalized a long time ago. You know, there's a lot of, you know, fight against it. I mean, tobacco industry, you know, uh, alcohol, all kinds of things were, you know, viewed as competition, and a lot of powers that be just didn't want it to happen. So the public is making the decision with the purse, and they're buying the stuff, and uh, stock market's going up in those sectors so it's going to happen well i contend tobacco is the gateway drug i haven't seen a drug addict yet who doesn't smoke okay well i don't smoke it's, well either. And listen you're not talking about smoking marijuana you know there's drops and yes. other ways of administering it you don't have to be smoking it i would say definitely don't smoke you don't want to pollute your lungs no you, you know it, it, it yeah it's a chemical additive you could you know mix it in your soup you know what i mean <laughs> so forget the smoking aspect but yeah you're right uh well tobacco kills 630 canadians a day uh, i don't know non-prescription drugs maybe 20 but you know you don't see news stories about oh look at that guy using tobacco uh, he's got a 50 50 chance of dying from it right well the tobacco companies you know were snooping around in the marijuana industry a few years ago when i went to several of the conferences you know philip morris was there and others and you know they're all snooping around figuring how they can get a piece of the pie here and you know, many of my sources indicated a while back that they had funded secretly through hedge funds and other manner the industry without publicly coming out and saying they're doing it into their official stockholders. So they have an interest in the growing of it and the, and the you know, uh, cultivating and so forth, but it's not publicly talked about because they don't want to be accused of it. But once it all becomes 100% legal and the Banking Act is passed and it's rescheduled, then you're going to find out that all the major cigarette companies are in it. And, of course, many of them had created those uh, 
those smokeless uh, devices, you know, uh, you know, with uh, all kinds of funny, you know, additives to them and tastes and smells. And so, you know, uh, they were getting into the industry indirectly. But, uh, yeah, anyway, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I personally don't use um, marijuana, though I have used some CBD occasionally. But I'm just talking about the uh, research, the obvious research and the benefits uh, of it. And, you know, we have to weigh that against uh, the negatives. So, also, uh, a lot of governments think- are desperate for tax revenue. Portland found it was making so much money from marijuana, it, it actually didn't know what to do with it. Well, all of our schools are funded. Our hospitals are, are doing okay. Uh, Alberta in Canada, the province which had a uh, conservative government which fought the most against marijuana, has the most marijuana shops in the country, and it pulls in uh, tens of millions of dollars from it. In the city of Edmonton, everywhere where there's a mom-and-pop grocery store, there's a liquor store and then a pot store. So now they totally embraced free enterprise in Alberta. Yeah, well, you know, the model started with uh, the first place, Colorado, when it started several years ago, and uh, the taxation benefits and everything caught the ear and eye of all the other states that ultimately followed Colorado. And, uh, yeah, it's it's a revenue thing. Listen, there was uh, friction against the uh, lottery system, if you're going back to the 1970s, you know, when this all started. Oh, yeah, the lottery is the worst possible thing until government realized how much money they can make, and suddenly all the states have lotteries now including in Canada. So, uh, you know, ultimately, I guess, you follow the dollar, you know, you follow the money, and that's really what it's all about. There's no money involved, and uh, then it wouldn't, all these things wouldn't be happening, obviously. So that's the story. Now, uh, I was wondering, Germany plans to legalize April 1st. In North America, 420 is associated with marijuana, but also in Germany, 420 is Hitler's birthday. Maybe not. Oh, I hope that's not a t- correct an- uh, analogy, but whatever. <laughs> at, least, at least they're doing it April 1st, not on April 20th, I guess, right? We'll have more with Mark Leibovit right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Mark Leibovit. Mark, one of the hottest IPOs ever, Trump Media. What's the story there? Well, you know, it, it was sort of on the back burner for a while. They they merged into a shell company called Digital World Acquisition Corp, and it was completed uh, uh, this past uh, Monday. And that's one of these, like, um, you know, shell companies that has uh, funding and just money waiting to acquire a company. And this has been sort of on the back burner here for a while. So they finally did the merger, and so the Trump Media and Technology Group, but now it's DJT is a ticker symbol, which funnily mirrors his initials, Donald J. Trump, right? <laughs> so anyway, G- DJT is a ticker, and apparently Trump's majority stake in the company is worth more than $5 billion, so more power to him, particularly with uh, the um, Democratic um, numbskulls in new york trying to take away his properties for ridiculous uh, charges and trumped up no play on the word trump but trumped up charges against them but anyway it's a you know hot stock here the last few days it ran up you know like anything else uh, will it make money had a big spike here um you know it all comes down to revenues and so forth and so on how viable the company is and uh I guess as the presidency draws closer and, and if he succeeds, you would think that would uh, benefit the company and the stock at, at least for a while. So, um, um, you know, if, if I had owned it up prior to this and had such a big run-up, it ran up from like $30 to almost, well, almost $78. You know, as a trader, I probably would have taken my profits in it, but I can't claim that I had owned it. I would, frankly wasn't even tracking it that carefully, but uh, it's tradable. I mean, it moves all over the place, so it might be something to look at for intraday or swing trading of some sort. But it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, I think it's great because it's an embarrassment a bit to all the idiots out there, anti-Trump, who try to take his money away or sue him. I mean, if he makes I, more power to him, if he can make tens of billions of dollars on this stock uh, than these other fictitious, uh, ridiculous uh, claims and, and, you know, penalties that he has to pay will be less meaningless. It will be more meaningless. So, 
in any event, uh, it's just another vehicle to keep an eye on. And if you're a trader, you know, keep an eye on a pullback. I wouldn't be chasing it here, but that's just the way I look at stuff. Yeah, let's see if we get it, set, it settles back a bit. What's going on with gold? It's you know to me I'm looking at it just very bullish here. It's just trading back and forth in a technical um, parlance. We have a formation called a bullish flag formation on the charts where you have like a big surge up and then it trades within this pennant formation back and forth for a while. And to me it looks like it's a going to break out again. And that's sort of encouraging, particularly since the U.S. dollar has been trying to rally here recently a little bit and he really hasn't um, heard it very much. So. You know, with, with the, the debt situation, with the BRICS uh, trying to uh, get rid of the U.S. dollar, with, uh, you know, all the shenanigans going on in the world right now, I mean, uh, I'm still targeting gold up to about 2700 I think, is a reasonable target. And then, you know, who knows well beyond that, and I can't give you an exact time frame. So, yeah, we're in there, and uh, you got to be patient with it. I mean, it's it's like anything else. I mean, we've been charting and talking about gold since this whole thing started back in 2000, 24 years ago, when it was two, $300 an ounce, and it goes all the way up to, uh, you know, in 1900 something, and then it drops all the way back to 1000 and now it's uh, around the 20, just under the 2200 level. So, it, you know, everything has its dog, each dog has its day, and at some point gold will overdo it to the upside and will experience a serious correction. But I think we're in the time frame that it's, uh, you know, it's in play. Just like Bitcoin, you can say a thing about Bitcoin. You know, it started slow, had big move up, crashed a couple times, coming back now, and uh, it's tradable too, and uh, that has a future. What's going on with crude? Still positive in, in my work. The um, we had a little setback intraday on uh, today, Wednesday. We're making this recording early, and then it, it popped back. Uh, most of the uh, com- comments out there, Jim, were bearish on crude for weeks and weeks and weeks and uh, i keep seeing you know warren buffett out there buying occidental petroleum and i still see that deal with exxon taking over pioneer natural gas and uh, i think it's chevron going after hess and you know i mean they just uh the accumulation phase by companies that are consolidating in a commodity that is still needed worldwide and, uh, you know, we saw the lack of interest a little bit on uh, EV stocks as people decided they don't want to, you know, necessarily buy those and more interest in hybrid, which uses gas. So, you know, um, you know, crude oil, you and I have talked about this for the last several years. I mean, it's not going away so fast. And, uh, you know, I'm looking for huge uh, upside in crude. And this is regardless of whether we get you know, the World War Three theory uh, unfolds to a greater degree, though I feel we're already sort of underway with that anyway, you know, different forms. And, uh, you know, we still have demand. And if something, you know, geopolitical really unfolds here, it could be explosive for crude oil. So anyway, um, you know, if you want to look at these stocks, many of them pay decent dividends. And uh, Pioneer is one of them, and Exxon is another, and Oxy not as much. But, um, you know, they are tradable, but I'm still in a bullish mode with those, like anything else. And if it gets overdone, then we're going to get a little pullback at some point here. It looked like it was going to start this past week, but they still seem to have momentum. So I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt. What's happening with Goldman Sachs? Goldman Sachs came out uh, real bullish, uh, which worries me here a little bit when they make these prognostications. But now they're targeting the S&P to 6,000. Of course, we got to 5,200 already. Um, you know, my own work would say we're due for, you know, anywhere from a 5 to 10% correction here at some point. We're starting to see some of the uh, big names in the Ma- Magnificent Seven group, for example, most notably uh, a Tesla coming down and uh, even NVIDIA showing some uh, weakness here the last couple of days. So, you know, as a general rule, it's like that cover story that uh, we, I think I talked about last week. You know, the cover of Barron's came out with uh, Bull right on the cover. And, you know, my interpretation of history in the financial press says that when the press comes out with two bullish or bearish cover story reports, it's usually just the opposite that is happening. So with Barron's coming out with a bull on the cover, that reminds me, I think, of the March uh, 
um, 2000 peak in the NASDAQ. There was a bullish article right on the cover of uh, Barron's at that time. Of course, that's 24 years ago, but, you know, patterns t- tend to repeat themselves. And when Goldman Sachs says we're going to 6,000, if you recall, there weren't too many years ago when Goldman uh, was predicting uh, crude oil was going to go to 200 when it was 140, and then it collapsed from there. Of course, I think that was 2007 or 2008 when that uh, that occurred. So, you know, anytime there's too much uh, bullish sentiment or reports out there, it usually tells me this is part and parcel to a, a you know, topping phase here a little bit. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm giving, you know, trying to give the market the benefit of the doubt because of the presidential election and everything. But, you know, I was also looking for outlier events, uh, so-called black swan, a lot of cyclical work that I do. And I've been talking and writing about that. And then we had this Baltimore Bridge disaster the last couple of days and that all fits into this black swan uh, outlier event scenario that i've created and put, talked about and then we have the solar eclipse coming up april 8th and uh that could have uh, be coincident with some other factors you know i look at the geopolitical and the geocosmic together we'll see if that unfolds and uh we also have a um, new moon on april 8th which is the day of the solar eclipse so you know, uh, I don't know, next week or so, I'd be uh, a little nervous. I know we've got uh, Good Friday coming up and Easter, uh, and, um, you know, I don't want to, you know, make any negative comments over those holidays, but we're in a time frame which could be dangerous, too. So uh, I'm, I'm not, um, you know, jumping up and down about the stock market up here. I'm more excited about the cannabis stocks, uh, gold stocks, you know, uh, gold trading, you know, and, um, you know, some of the, you know, maybe the Donald Trump stock. I mean, things, little sectors or individual situations that look uh, look interesting, you know, versus being along the S&P the way uh, Goldman Sachs is talking about. So focusing on what's moving with the old expression as a bull market somewhere. And uh, I know we've been in a bull market, but I think it's way overdone. But, you know, we take it a day at a time here and uh, we're doing pretty well uh, calling some of the names that I just uh, referred to in this interview. Mark, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me, and have a great Good Friday, and Happy Easter to all. My guest has been Mark Leibovit, editor and publisher of the Leibovit VR newsletters, also known as VRTrader.com. If you have any questions for Mark or for any of our guests, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. We'll ask that question for you. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on X at House Street. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.